Good evening. My name is Jonathan Judakin, and as the Spence L. Wilson Chair in the Humanities, I have the pleasure of organizing the Communities in Conversation series here at Rhodes College. It is a really gorgeous night tonight. Um, so I want to welcome all of you to our beautiful campus. Um, are there some high school students here tonight? Do we have some kids from White Station High School? A few of you are out there. Here we go. Um, at least as I understand it, I hope they're here. There are students who traveled all the way from St. Louis in order to be here. Are the students from, wait for it, Ulysses S. Grant High School in St. Louis. Are they here yet? Oh, okay. Come down from St. Louis. All right. Um, well, thanks all of you for being here with us tonight. You should know that by being here tonight, you are actually making history. And I say this because the history that we're going to be learning about tonight was a pivotal moment in the history of Memphis, the history of the South, and the history of the United States. But it has long been a buried story for the past 150 years. As we were driving here this evening from downtown Memphis, we went by the Nathan Bedford Forrest statue, and I commented to Professor Ash that that's the simplest explanation for why this history has been buried. It's because there was another story that people wanted to make sure you heard and understood and internalized about these years uh, that we're going to be talking about. And it's, it's for that reason that we don't know this story. But by being here tonight, you are bearing witness to the past. I want to open tonight by reading the last two lines from Stephen Ash's book. Now, this was published in 2013. Here are the last two lines. There is no memorial marking the events of May 1st through 3rd, 1866. Perhaps the sesquicentennial in 2016 will provide an opportunity to rectify this lapse of memory, to acknowledge publicly the screams and groans of the dying victims at Memphis and to allow their ghosts at last to rest. That is precisely what is happening. That is happening tonight, that is going to be happening across this city, that has been happening. Um, those were prophetic lines since we've begun this commemoration, and there will be a marker um, to the Memphis Massacre. As Professor Ash prophetically foretold, tonight we will be engaged in telling ghost stories. And it's our belief that by learning about these ghost stories, we will open ourselves up to a whole spiritual universe that remains underexplored and underexamined about the history of the United States in the era of Reconstruction, when the original sin of slavery was to be redressed in America, but that business went unfinished, and we continue to be haunted by the failures of having, uh, uh, of what we did not settle uh, in the Reconstruction era still today. Making our seance possible were a number of folks that I wanna, I wanna thank. Brother Chuck McKinney, Director of Africana Studies, Walt Tennyson and the Bonner Center for Faith and Service, Elizabeth Thomas, Charles Hughes and the Memphis Center, and Tim Hubner and the Department of History. Communities in Conversation would simply not be possible without the ongoing support of Roz Kenny Birch, uh, Jack uh, Anastasi, and all of the Rhodes Lecture Board, and without the serious spade work done by 
these amazing women um, every day, Jackie Baker, Bonnie Whitehouse, and Sue Eltayesh. At the end of Professor Ash's prepared remarks, which are gonna go on for about 45 minutes, we'll have a Q&A for about 45 minutes. We've set out index cards um, on your seats in the hope that these can be a useful place for you to perhaps make some uh, notes and for you to formulate your thoughts uh, before asking a question. And Sue and Bonnie will be taking around microphones. Please use them uh, to aid our recording of this event. And as an incentive to students, not only to stay for what I think is usually the best part of these events, but to participate, we will give students who ask a question, students, <laughs> these fabulous t-shirts. So stick around and stick up your hand. Please um, turn off your cell phones or turn them on silent and only use them if you are tweeting about tonight's talk. <laughs> Hashtag Memphis Massacre 1866. Um, we have a number of other uh, things that are, that are on your seats. There are, uh, there, there's information about the event that we'll uh, be a part of next month that's being put together by the P Pierce Shakespeare Endowment uh, to commemorate the 400th anniversary of uh, the death of Shakespeare, April 21st and 22nd. Please take uh, those with you. There are also postcards. We don't have them on all the seats, but there are more postcards here about the many other events that are going to be following uh, from tonight um, commemorating the Memphis Massacre. You can find all the details about each of those events um, on the website. But I do want to mention that on Tuesday night, the 22nd, in the Memphis room of the Hooks Library, We'll have a lifelong learning class on the Memphis Massacre taught by Professor Tim Hubner, the chair of the history department. He will synthesize some of what you will hear tonight, uh, give his own spin on things as an expert on the South and uh, the Civil War era, uh, and he will also facilitate an open Q&A and discussion. Um, so join him, bring some friends along for that at the Hooks Library on the 22nd, that's Tuesday night from 5.30 to 7.30 in the Memphis Room. Uh, this is part of a new initiative at Rhodes uh, that brings us together with the public library to facilitate lifelong learning opportunities in our community. The last thank you goes to the heavy hitters in this whole effort to commemorate the Memphis Massacre on its 150th anniversary. Our colleagues at the University of Memphis, Susan O'Donovan and Beverly Bond. They've brought together a whole slew of community organizations. I do, let's give them a round of applause. I, I was chatting with Susan earlier and she said, you know, this whole thing has taken on a life of its own. I said, no, this is about the railroad tracks and the train that you've built that's allowing it to go to each of the stations that it needs to stop at for us to fully register the significance of this moment. And they're in partnership with all kinds of different folks all across the community, including the National Park Service and the NAACP and many others. It's all leading up to the culmination of a major conference that's gonna be bringing in top historians uh, that will take place at the University of Memphis on May uh, 21st through, 20th and 21st, don't wanna screw those dates up. Um, so our event is a part of the series that they have organized. It's really an amazing uh, thing that they've done and we're proud to be a part of that effort. Now that I've thanked everyone, let me introduce our speaker this evening and I will do so very briefly so that you can hear what he wants to teach us. Uh, before writing a massacre in Memphis, the race riot that shook the nation one year after the Civil War, Professor Ash wrote six other important books on the history of Tennessee and the South 
in the era of the Civil War. Uh, he is a major su historian of the South and the Civil War era who did a lot of that uh, work in the 40 years uh, that he has spent at the University of Tennessee. He'll be signing copies of his definitive a massacre in Memphis after the event tonight. So make sure that you pick up a copy before you leave because there's a lot more that you can learn from the book than he's gonna have time to explain here tonight. But without further ado, Professor Stephen Ash. Thank you, Jonathan, for that very kind introduction. And thank you all for coming tonight. I, I'm just amazed by the size of the crowd and the interest that I've already seen uh, demonstrated here tonight. So I will try not to disappoint. My, uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight is, is one of the uglier chapters in American history. It's, it's a fascinating chapter, I think. Uh, but it's, it's one that's not comfortable to contemplate. Uh, it is a story with more villains than heroes uh, and no happy ending. But it's an important story to know if we are to fully appreciate how significant racial hatred and racial violence have been in shaping our nation's past. It's, important story, it's an important story to know too if we are to fully appreciate how Americans grappled with the momentous issues that grew out of the Civil War of 1861 to 1865 and how those issues were ultimately resolved. What happened, to put it briefly, very briefly, was this. In May of 1866, one year after the Civil War ended and the slaves were freed, Mobs of white men in Memphis went on a 36 hour long rampage through the city. By the time this race riot ended, approximately 46 black people had been murdered, uh, among them a number of women and children. Many other black people were assaulted, many were robbed, several were raped, and every black church and school in the city was burned to the ground. That's four churches and 12 schools, along with almost 100 homes of African Americans in the city. Witnesses later testified that they heard the rioters boasting that they intended to kill every black person in Memphis or drive them out of the city. One rioter was heard inciting others with the cry, kill every Negro no matter who, men or women. Another was heard proclaiming exultantly, it is the white man's day now. To understand how such a thing could happen, we have to understand how profoundly unsettled the South was uh, in, in the wake of the Civil War. We have to understand how the defeat of the Confederacy and the emancipation of the slaves had revolutionized the South, uh, opening opportunities for black people that they could hardly have dreamed of before the war, and at the same time threatening everything that Southern whites believed in. Northern victory in the Civil War had decided two great issues. It had settled two great questions that had long troubled the American nation. The attempt of southern states to withdraw from the Union and form their own slaveholding republic was crushed and slavery was abolished. But the war left other great questions unresolved, questions that would have to be addressed in the post-war era of Reconstruction. And among these was exactly what, what kind of freedom these four million freed black people in the South would experience, what, what freedom would really mean for them. Because there are, of course, many ways to define freedom. And there, are many, there were many forms that freedom might conceivably have taken after the Civil War. Uh, 
it was not at all certain in the spring of 1865 when the war ended, it was not at all certain uh, what the status of the freed people would be in the South. Uh, it was not at all certain what their future would look like. There were various ideas floating around about what freedom should mean. Southern whites in the aftermath of the war had their own ideas about what freedom should mean for the black people of the South. Uh, their definition was a very narrow one, a very narrow one. Southern whites had always believed black people to be inherently inferior and potentially dangerous. Uh, and emancipation did not change that belief. They held on to that belief as firmly after the war as they had before the war. Now, and then I mean in the wake of the Civil War, now white, Southern whites conceded only that black people could no longer be bought and sold and that their, their marriages and their parenthood would be you know, legally recognized. That's it. That's all the white people of the South conceded was that, that freedom, all that freedom means for black people is they can no longer be bought and sold and we will legally recognize their marriages and their parenthood. In all other ways, the Southern whites believe, black people must remain subservient to whites, they must remain a docile and cheap labor force, uh, and in no way were they to be considered equal citizens. Now this kind of racism strikes us today as appalling. But before we condemn it too harshly, let, let, let's see it in its historical context. The belief in black inferiority was the norm among white people in that era. And I don't just mean Southern whites, I mean Northern white people too, North and South. It was simply taken for granted that people of African descent were inferior to white people. It was taught to white children from the cradle. Uh, very few white Americans above or below the Mason-Dixon line uh, managed to rise above this kind of ingrained racism uh, and embrace black people as, as real equals. Now, this, when I explain this, this is not to excuse the white racism of that era. Uh, it's only to make it understandable. Uh, I think it's important we understand it, uh, even if we can't excuse it. And it is certainly not to excuse the violence and even the cruelty with which some white people tried to impose their vision of black freedom in the post-war South. What about the emancipated slaves? What, how did they see their situation in this immediate post-war period? Well, not surprisingly, they had a far more expansive view of what their freedom should consist of than the Southern, the Southern whites did. To the freed people, it was, it was not enough that they could no longer be put on the auction block. Uh, it was not enough that they no longer had to endure the separation of their families. Husbands taken away from wives, children taken away from their mothers, and sold away. You know, what they wanted was full equality, real equality, and even a measure of autonomy. What they, what they wanted, what they were seeking in the post-war world was to make the most of the freedom that they had gained as a result of the war. The post-war months were a time of great ferment among the African Americans in the South, among these freed people. A time of great ferment as they sought to completely cast off the chains of slavery and to undo all the wrongs that slavery had imposed upon them. Okay. All across the South, uh, black people were restless and hopeful. In those months immediately after the war, they took steps to reunite, reunite their separated families whenever possible. They took steps to formalize their marriages, which had not been legally recognized uh, in the days of slavery. Uh, they moved out of the plantation slave quarters uh, and established uh, homes and communities and churches of their own. They began calling for grants of land so that they could, they could uh, establish their own family farms and secure a measure of economic independence. And they began calling for legal equality, 
political rights, even the right to vote. All across the South in these post-war months, there arose conflicts then. It will not surprise you to learn, uh, having, having now sketched out what white people saw as the future of the black race and what, what black people saw as the future of the black race. It will not surprise you that all across the South in those months, conflict arose between black people seeking to make the most of their freedom and white people who were determined to restrict that freedom, to make it a very narrow kind of freedom. And to further complicate matters, the federal government was also making its, present felt, its presence felt too. So let me say a word about the federal government here. In the months after the war ended, the South remained under military occupation by U.S. Army troops, though not under martial law. It was not under martial law. But federal troops were stationed throughout the South though the civil authorities were legally in control, uh, at least after the summer of 1865, uh, the federal army commanders uh, in the South could and did on occasion uh, intervene in local matters when they felt it necessary, especially when they saw uh, black people being abused by white people. So you've got the army posted throughout the South. Another arm of the federal government that was active in these post-war uh, months in the South was the Freedmen's Bureau. The Freedmen's Bureau was a, a federal agency created by Congress uh, when the war ended. And its purpose was to uh, assist the freed slaves in their transition from, from slavery to freedom. The Freedmen's Bureau had even more authority than the army to intervene uh, in matters in the South. In fact, the Freedmen's Bureau had, under the legislation that created it, the Freedmen's Bureau had f authority over every aspect of black life and race relations in the South. It even set up its own courts uh, to try cases involving blacks when they could not get justice in the white courts, the civil courts. So, we've got the Army, at work in the South, you've got the Freedmen's Bureau at work in the South. Meanwhile, and this is the broader context to this all, meanwhile, things were going on in Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C., President Andrew Johnson, Abraham Lincoln's successor, was locked in battle with Congress uh, over the future of the South. Andrew Johnson, uh, a Southerner, a Tennessean, and a Democrat, but a Unionist who had, of course, supported the Union during the war. Uh, Johnson had very firm ideas about how the South should be reconstructed and restored to the Union. This was the great debate going on in this, the first year after the Civil War. Uh, he had very firm ideas about how the South should be reconstructed, about how the former rebels, the ex-Confederates, were to be treated, uh, about and about what role the freed slaves should play in all of this. In general, Johnson sided with the former Confederates and was unsympathetic, to say the least, uh, to the former slaves. But the Republican-dominated Congress had very different ideas. Uh, the Congressional Republicans insisted that the former Confederates, whom they regarded as traitors, uh, should not be let off the hook too easily after what they had done over the last four years. The Congressional Republicans insisted too that the freed slaves must have some federal protection. And they insisted that the restoration of the southern states to the Union should not proceed until the southern states had reformed themselves. That is, that they, until the southern uh, states had shown themselves worthy of readmission to the Union. This battle in Washington heated up between the Congress and the President. It heated up as 1865 gave way to 1866. And by the spring of 1866, uh, it was by no means clear who was going to win this great battle over the future of the South and its people. It was by no means clear 
what kind of reconstruction uh, the South and the Southern people, black and white, were going to, under, going to undergo. So this, this period, a year after the Civil War that we're looking at now, this is uh, a, a, it was a time of great conflict and tension in the South. It's, I mean, it's, it's just a, a, a very profound tension, conflict, but also a time of hope and determination. Uh, but, but a time, above all, of great uncertainty. No, they, these people didn't have the advantage of, of hindsight like we do now. We know how it all turned out. They didn't. They didn't. As they looked at events there in the spring of 1866, one year after the Civil War, they did not know uh, uh, what the future would bring. They were uneasy. They were anxious. Uh, black and white people in the South uh, looking around at the events in the South and looking at events in Washington, wondering how this is all going to play out. A time of great uncertainty. So that's kind of the, 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 the wider context of these events in Memphis. Amid all this turmoil in the South, in that first year after the, the end of the war, amid all this turmoil, the Southern cities, including Memphis, became kind of magnets for the freed slaves, uh, drawing them by the tens of thousands from the, from the countryside. Why? What did the cities uh, have to offer here? Why, why were the cities so attractive to these newly liberated black people? Well, for one thing, it was in the cities that the U.S. Army garrison troops were posted. And it was in the cities where the Freedmen's Bureau offices and courts were located. So in other words, it was in the southern cities, like Memphis, where the federal government's presence was most powerfully felt. Uh, it was more difficult, uh, even with the South defeated, it was more difficult at this time for that federal power to reach into the countryside. Southern whites continued to own the plantations and in many ways continued to dominate the rural areas. Also in the cities were northern missionaries. Uh, an interesting group of people, idealistic men and women who came south after the war to, to help the freed slaves, to establish schools and teach them to read and write and to prepare them uh, for the, uh, you know, to, to, to achieve their full potential in the post-war world. So they're, they're in the cities there too. So to the former slaves, I mean, why were the cities so attractive? Well, it seemed to them, it seemed to them that the cities in this post-war world offered both safety and opportunity. Uh, in contrast to the countryside where the whites still had the power to keep them down. Uh, it was in the cities that they could enjoy, that the, the freed slaves could enjoy uh, real freedom and real security, or so they thought. In the post-war months, black people flocked from the plantations to the cities in huge numbers. Memphis was one of these urban magnets. The black population of Memphis, when the Civil War began in 1861, was, was probably around, it was around 4,000, the black population. Five years later, in the spring of 1866, it was probably around 20,000. They flocked to the city, even though the living conditions there were, to put it mildly, wretched. Uh, the city was not a pleasant place to live in 1866. It was filthy. Uh, it was crowded. It was plagued with disease. It was uh, poorly run by the city government. There were not enough jobs to go around for everybody who came to the city. Most of the black people who came to the city <clears throat> in that period had to live in shanties or rundown tenements. But they came anyway, and to most of them it was worth it. It was worth it. These black newcomers to the city exuberantly celebrated their, their freedom in Memphis. They established churches, they established fraternal organizations, they enrolled their children in the missionary schools. They, they sought justice in the Freedmen's Bureau Court. Uh, they, they held political rallies. And above all, they abandoned that 
uh, obsequious deference towards white people that had always been expected of them when they were slaves. Now, uh, they looked white people in the eye and demanded respect. Among these black people in the city in the spring of 1866 were 1,600 men of the 3rd Colored Heavy Artillery, uh, a regiment of U.S. Army garrison troops. This regiment had been formed in Memphis during the war uh, after the Union Army captured the city and uh, after the federal government began recruiting black troops. The men were stationed uh, in a fort in the southern part of the city, and the southern part of the city was informally known as South Memphis at that time. And that is where most of the black people in Memphis lived uh, at, the, at this time. In the spring of 1866, they lived in what was known as South Memphis. And the troops were stationed in a fort there, and many of them, uh, the regiment had been there since 1863, uh, many of them had wives and children in the, in the neighborhood there. So the, the, the regiment was very much embedded in the, in the community, the black community of Memphis. The great majority of black people in Memphis at that time were decent, hardworking people committed to their families, uh, committed to their churches. Inevitably, however, there were some, a minority, who lived less than respectable lives, uh, who avoided honest work, who got drunk and rowdy and committed crimes. Uh, among them were a good number of the soldiers of the third colored heavy artillery, which had uh, gained a reputation of being a somewhat uh, undisciplined unit. So that is the situation of black Memphis in, in the spring of 1866, a time of hope, uh, a time of great ferment, uh, a time of great expectations. Let's look at it now through the eyes of Memphis's white population. White Memphians reacted bitterly, to say the least, over what they saw as this invasion of their city by lazy, insolent black people and meddling Yankees. They saw every incident of black misbehavior or black self-assertion as proof that emancipation had been a terrible mistake and that the freed people were dangerously out of control. They denounced the presence of the U.S. Army and the Freedmen's Bureau as unnecessary, gratuitous. It was, they said, nothing less than tyranny totally unnecessary. They insisted, this, the, the white people of, of Memphis insisted, that those who had, you know, the former Confederates, insisted that they now fully accepted defeat and emancipation. They insisted that they were now peaceful and ready to move on with their lives as loyal citizens of the United States. And they insisted that they would deal fairly with the freed slaves without federal coercion if only these meddling Yankees would just leave them alone to deal with the black people on their own and work matters out on their own. We will be fair. We can do it. We will do it, they said. That was their attitude. The Yankees' presence is just uh, uh, an insult to us and unnecessary. Certain Memphis newspapers stoked this white anger, editorializing continually on the alleged threat uh, imposed uh, posed by these black people and their Yankee friends, especially the Freedmen's Bureau and the missionaries. Uh, in the eyes of Memphis's white population, uh, these, the Freedmen's Bureau agents especially and the missionaries uh, encouraged the black people's misbehavior with all this preposterous talk about uh, just racial justice and equal, equal rights. They also claimed that these Yankee meddlers uh, encouraged black indolence and crime. Every incident of black crime was played up in the newspaper, sensationally, even luridly, uh, in, the, in the newspaper. Some of the editorials, uh, to read some of these editorials in the Memphis newspapers uh, in those months after the war, 
uh, very disturbing. In some cases, they, they virtually dehumanized the black population. Here are some, here are some actual words from, from various newspaper editorials in those post-war months. Uh, blacks were, the blacks of Memphis were fiends. They were monsters. They were motivated by beastly passions. Uh, they were living in vice uh, and idleness and infamy. Those are the actual words. This is, this is the kind of, of uh, uh, newspaper journalism that the white people of Memphis uh, were reading. Uh, as I say, very disturbing uh, to, to read these now. But uh, you can get an idea of what the, you know, where the, the, how the white people of the city were thinking. The black, t the black soldiers were particular targets of white animosity uh, because of, there was nothing more frightening to a white southerner in, in that era than the idea of a black man with a gun in his hand. Uh, the whites demanded that the black troops be removed from the city. The stories about black crime and black vice uh, in the newspapers and on the street among whites were, were exaggerated. But nevertheless, white people believed them. Many white people in that city by the spring of 1866 had become convinced that Memphis was experiencing a deluge of black crime and that they were not going to be safe until the black population was brought under strict control and their Yankee friends were gone. The most bitter and angry were the working class white men, particularly the large population of Irish immigrants in the city who competed with the blacks for jobs. The Irish dominated the ranks of the city police department and frequently brutalized uh, black Memphians. I must point out that this racial hostility was mutual. Believe me, it was repaid in kind uh, by the blacks, uh, some of whom by the spring of 1866 had decided that they were simply not going to take any more abuse from white people, especially the police. The atmosphere in the city by that spring of 1866, uh, the racial atmosphere had become so heated, so volatile that a lot of people had come to believe that, a lot of Memphians had come to believe that a racial explosion of some kind was inevitable. So when it finally happened, it was not altogether a surprise for many people. Uh, you know, the virulence of it perhaps was a surprise, uh, the savagery of it, but the fact that there was some kind of an explosion, a lot of people had kind of half expected it for a long time because the atmosphere was so tense, volatile. Anyway, that prophecy was fulfilled uh, on the afternoon of May 1st, 1866, when four Irish policemen confronted a crowd of several dozen black men who were drinking and carousing on a street in South Memphis. Now these men were members of the third colored heavy artillery who had just been mustered out of service the day before, literally the day before. April 30th, the whole regiment had been mustered out. But these men were still in their uniforms, uh, and although they were officially disarmed, some were carrying concealed pistols. So anyway, they're, they're, they're drinking whiskey out of their canteens, they're sitting around on the street in South Memphis, and the cops come up and they decide they want this crowd dispersed. They order the crowd to disperse, Although technically they had no right to, the police had no right to, because technically the, this, black, this crowd of black men was just outside the city limits, just outside the city limits. So the black men refused. You know, we're not going to disperse, they said. And not only that, remember what I said about a lot of, a lot of black people had decided by that time they were not going to take any more abuse from the police, this high-handed treatment they'd been getting for so long. Uh, some of the black men, not only, they not only refused to disperse, they started taunting the policemen. They started cursing them. One of the black men yelled out, hurrah for Abe Lincoln, to which one of the cops replied, your old friend Abe Lincoln is dead and damned. More angry words were exchanged. Tempers on both sides uh, grew very heated. 
the cops, seeing that they're getting nowhere and realizing that they were heavily outnumbered, decided to break off this encounter and go get reinforcements. So they started retreating up the street. Uh, the black men started following them. They weren't going to let the cops just back out of this. They started following them, uh, cursing at them, uh, shoving them, brandishing clubs and rocks. Then one black man in the crowd pulled out his pistol, his concealed pistol, and fired it into the air. Not at the policeman, but into the air in order to frighten the policeman and kind of speed them along on their retreat. But the policeman thought they were being fired at. They halted, pulled out their own revolvers, and fired into the crowd of black men. Whereupon other members of the crowd pulled out their pistols and started shooting at the police. This shootout lasted no more than about 20 seconds, and the aim on both sides was not particularly good. Um, one policeman was wounded in that shootout. One of the four policemen stayed to help him, while the other two policemen started running towards downtown, to the police station downtown. The, the black crowd pursued those two and wounded another one as he was, as he was running. But after that, uh, after chasing the, those two policemen for a few blocks, the crowd gave up the chase and uh, dispersed. Okay. So the incident you know, was over, basically, right then, or should have been. But word of this encounter spread through the city with lightning speed. Remember what I said about the atmosphere in the city and the, the beliefs of the whites that they were on the verge you know, of, of you know, a, a deluge of black crime. As word got out about this encounter, many white people panicked. The rumor that was out on the street, you know, already magnified, you know, uh, was that the whole population of the population of South Memphis, the whole black population, was in a full-scale rev rev revolt. It was an uprising and they were going to slaughter all the white people in the cities. This is the kind of panicky rumor that starts circulating on the basis of this you know, very brief uh, shootout on a street in South Memphis. Mobs of white men armed with pistols and clubs formed up spontaneously downtown, uh, marched down to South Memphis, and began shooting and beating black people indiscriminately, men, women, and children everyone they spotted on the streets, just shooting them down or clubbing them. Over the next 36 hours, other mobs repeatedly returned to the black section of town, black in, in, in Memphis, South Memphis, uh, and attacked blacks on the streets, uh, in their homes, and set fires. Almost all the rioters, as far as, as far as it can be known, almost all the rioters were working class Irishmen, including many policemen. The police were, in fact, uh, the, 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 basically the leaders, if you can call them that, of, of these mobs. The results, as I mentioned before, uh, after 36 hours of, of rioting, the results were four dozen black people murdered, many others beaten savagely, some raped, churches, schools, and homes burned to the ground. The black people of Memphis were powerless to resist this onslaught, this massive onslaught. Uh, a, a few tried fighting back, uh, but it was, it was hopeless. The black soldiers uh, were in no position to help. As I mentioned, the regiment had been mustered out and disarmed the day before. Not a single white person was killed by a black person over these, this 36 hours of riding that stretched out over three days. Not a single white person was killed by a black person during, during the riot, although uh, a few were wounded. The riot went on for a full 36 hours, as I've said. Why was it allowed to go on so long? Well, for one thing, the city authorities uh, took no action to restore order. The mayor, 
of the city, uh, in fact, was drunk during the entire riot. But even very, very drunk for part of it, and just a little drunk for other parts of it. But he was drunk. Uh, but even had he been sober, he could not have restored order with his police force because, as I said, the police themselves were among the, the, the leading rioters. So the city authorities are doing nothing. This left it up to the U.S. Army, the only other, you know, the only other force in the city. The Freedmen's Bureau had you know, no weapons of its own. They were just a, you know, an, an, an unarmed federal agency. The Army was there. But the Army authorities were very slow to respond to this. The Army commander in the city, who had several companies of white troops at his disposal, uh, after the black regiment was, was uh, mustered out, uh, they still had uh, several white companies uh, posted there. Uh, the, the Federal Army commander kept making excuses for not deploying those uh, companies of his until the rioting had reached such an intensity that he could no longer remain aloof. Uh, he was never held to account for what, you know, in my opinion, is a dereliction of duty. Nor was any rioter ever punished. No rioter was ever punished uh, for his actions on those three days. My book is the first full-scale study of this riot. Articles had been written before, uh, but no full-scale book, no book, which is, which is surprising to me because the sources are so extraordinarily rich. When I began uh, to work on this book, I had no idea just how rich the sources were. Uh, it is, this riot is, in fact, one of the best documented episodes of the entire 19th century in America. In the wake of the riot, there were no fewer than three federal investigations of it. The Army carried out its own investigation, the Freedmen's Bureau carried out an investigation, and then Congress got into the act and formed a special subcommittee to investigate uh, the Memphis riot. These, uh, between the three of these, these investigative bodies, Hundreds of witnesses were called, hundreds of Memphians. Uh, many of them testified at great length and in great detail, and their testimony was recorded verbatim. They had stenographers there trained in shorthand and took down their testimony word for word, exactly as they spoke it. These witnesses, hundreds of them, came from all walks of life. They were, they were blacks as well as whites. There were women and children who testified as well as men. Uh, there were the Yankees as well as Southerners, uh, and many of these witnesses were, were poor and illiterate, the kind of people whose voices are rarely heard uh, in the surviving documents we have from the 19th century. So this is an extraordinary uh, uh, wealth of sources there in all this testimony, this verbatim testimony. The newspapers of the time also uh, provide a great deal of information. Uh, not necessarily the Memphis newspapers, which tended to be very prejudiced, but other newspapers got, got firsthand reports of the rioting uh, of, and, and printed that. Uh, the city government records are also very useful. I, I looked at those. And many other records of all sort. But altogether, this is a huge wealth of sources uh, on, this, on this riot. As I said, one of the best documented events of the whole, the whole century. This wealth of sources allowed me not only to write a full, almost minute-by-minute minute account of, of the riot uh, itself, but also to paint a very detailed uh, portrait of the city in which this riot occurred and the people who experienced it. In responding to the investigators' questions, these witnesses often revealed a lot more than just what they saw during the riot. Uh, for one thing, uh, because this was testimony was taken down verbatim by stenographers, uh, you can hear the actual language, the everyday language that these people spoke, which doesn't always come through in the, in the kind of documents we get from the 19th century, where it tends to be kind of gussied up and more formal uh, than people really spoke. But, but, but reading these testimonies, you can get a sense of how the people really talked you know, on the street, ordinary people. They talked sometimes, too. They, they, they revealed in, in their testimonies, as they're talking about the riot, they also revealed how they dressed. 
They revealed how their houses were furnished when they testified about what they lost, the property they lost when their house was torched. They explained you know, what, about how they furnished their homes. Fascinating stuff. They talked in many cases about where they had come from, why and when they had come to Memphis. Uh, they talked about how they made their living. They talked about how they got along with one another across the divides of race and gender. They talked about how they viewed the past and the present and the future. Fascinating sources. In the chapters of my book that recount the riot itself, uh, I did something that is not customary among historians and certainly was a first for me. Uh, I decided to write the narrative uh, in the present tense. This seemed to me the best way to convey uh, the, the drama of the riot and the kaleidoscopic rush of events and this minute by minute uh, contingency and confusion and the sheer horror of it all. Um, so if I may, I'd like to read just a, a, a short passage from this. I know a lot of you have read the book already, but for those who have not, uh, let me read this short passage from one of the uh, riot narrative chapters uh, to give you a, a, a sense of the flavor of the book and also to convey the, a sense of the awful brutality that was exhibited in the riot. The scene here is Beale Street uh, on May the 1st, a little before sundown. Uh, the riot had broken out about an hour earlier some distance away and only now is it spreading to Beale Street. Uh, there is a crowd of white men, a mob of white men, forming on the street, on Beale Street. And it includes a number of policemen. And it has just assaulted a black man who was walking past a grocery store and tried to kill him, but he escaped. So here's, where, here's what I've written at that moment. Within moments, the crowd finds another victim. Jackson Goodell, a drayman and a devout Baptist, has just left his home, a rented basement in a house two doors from the grocery store. He is carrying a pan in which he intends to bring home some cornmeal from the grocery for his supper. His wife, Lavinia, would have run this errand, but she is unwell. There has been no shooting in this neighborhood, nor any other commotion loud enough to give warning to people indoors. Goodell does not know that the cluster of white men he sees ahead of him is thirsting for black blood. The crowd, numbering a dozen or so, pounces on Goodell as he nears the grocery, beating him on the head. He tries to escape, but gets no farther than the sidewalk in front of the store, where the blow of a club brings him to his knees. Another blow fells him completely. He collapses into the gutter. As the crowd continues to beat him, other white men and boys passing along the street come up to watch. Someone says, shoot him. One of the policemen pulls out a revolver and fires a bullet into Goodell at close range. Goodell groans loudly. Some in the crowd, including the policemen, walk away. But one policeman, having gone only four or five steps, abruptly stops and turns. He walks back to within a couple of paces of Goodell, points his pistol at him, and puts a second bullet into him. Goodell emits another loud groan. The crowd disperses, leaving Goodell where he lies. His wounds are very bad, but he is still breathing. Nearby, a black woman has witnessed this attack. She lives next door to the Goodells and attends the same church they do. To leave her house now is obviously dangerous, but she must tell Goodell's wife what has happened. She runs next door. Sister Lavinia, she cries. Jackson is killed. Lavinia rises from her sickbed and rushes to her husband's side. He is barely clinging to consciousness. She puts her hand to his chest and speaks his name, but he does not respond. She kneels in the gutter and cradles his bloody head in her hands. Three white men walk by. Lavinia hears one say, here is a damn Negro. If he is not dead, we will finish him. One of the others replies, you have killed him once. What do you want to kill him again for? They pass on. Another white man comes by. This one is sympathetic. He urges Lavinia to get her husband home where his wounds can be treated and offers to stay there with him while she gathers some friends to a sister. She accepts this offer but cannot find any blacks willing to risk their lives by coming out onto the street and carrying her husband home. Not knowing what else to do, she returns to Jackson's side and sits there with his head in her hands. 
Now, that passage might strike you as novelistic, but I assure you that every detail of it is literally true and very well documented in those extraordinary records that I mentioned. Uh, I took no artistic license. That's how rich the sources are. The Memphis riot is not only a very dramatic episode in American history, but an important one, too. Uh, accounts of it quickly spread across the nation by telegraph and newspaper, and it was the most sensational news event in America outside of Washington since the Confederate Army surrendered a year before. This became big, big national news. Most Americans were shocked and sickened uh, by the death toll, by the destruction, and by the evidence of the mob's savagery that came out in the newspapers and in the federal investigations. Uh, it was and remains one of the bloodiest and most destructive riots in American history. Reading accounts of the Memphis riot uh, and other incidents of white racial violence in the South during that period, many people outside the South concluded that white, the Southern whites could not be trusted to deal fairly with the freed people and concluded that the rebel states were not yet deserving of readmission to the Union. The Memphis riot was therefore a key factor leading Congress in 1867 to seize control of Reconstruction from President Johnson and to enact extraordinary measures uh, to delay the readmission of the Southern states to the Union to impose sanctions on the Southern whites, and to force the Southern states to give black people equal rights, including, eventually, the right to vote. And thus was launched one of the most remarkable and controversial eras of Southern history known as Radical Reconstruction. But the irony of it is that Southern whites reacted very differently to the riot. They drew very different conclusions about the meaning of this riot. Uh, they took their cue from some of the Memphis newspapers, which uh, in a classic case of blaming the victim, uh, newspapers in Memphis blamed the riot on the blacks themselves, claiming that their intolerable misbehavior and insolent in the months, insolence in the months leading up to the riot had provoked the riot, had provoked the white people. And of course, they, they, they insisted that the Yankee friends of the black people had egged them on, so they were guilty too. Uh, some of these newspapers went so far as to applaud the riot as a good lesson. Here are the words of one editorial of a Memphis newspaper just a few days after the riot. The Negroes have been forced to swallow their own medicine. The riot has been a lesson. And the Negroes will now have an awe and respect for the law, which they have at all times disregarded since they were emancipated. Here is another, here are some words of another uh, editorial at that time. Another newspaper editorialist said that the riot demonstrates that the southern white man will not be ruled by the Negro. The Negroes now know to their sorrow that it is best not to arouse the fury of the white man. As the Southern whites saw it, the events in Memphis were further evidence that emancipation had been a terrible mistake, that the freed slaves were dangerously out of control, and that violence in the service of white supremacy was justified and indeed necessary. That was the lesson that whites in the South took from the Memphis riot. These beliefs fueled the widespread violence, uh, white violence against blacks and their northern friends that the South witnessed in the years after 1866, particularly the organized violence of the Ku Klux Klan. This violence was a key factor in bringing Radical Reconstruction eventually to an end by 1877, a culmination that wiped out uh, many of the gains that Southern blacks had made since the war and left white supremacy triumphant in the South. So, this is, this is the irony as I see it of the, of the, the, the riot and the, the lessons that were taken from it by different Americans. Uh, ironically, therefore, even as the Memphis riot was helping to usher in 
this uh, extraordinary experiment of radical reconstruction. It was also helping to undermine it and to pave the way for its successor, the New South era of white supremacy, uh, black disfranchisement, and Jim Crow segregation in the South. So clearly, the, the Memphis riot was an important event in American history. Uh, however, these days, uh, it is virtually forgotten outside of the historical profession, outside the ranks of professional historians. The vast majority of Americans, I would, I would imagine, ask a typical man or woman on the street about the Memphis riot, they would either confess their ignorance or perhaps mention the events of April 1968 uh, in the, uh, the, the following the Martin Luther King assassination. The riot deserves to be better known. That is why I'm grateful for this opportunity that Rhodes College has given me to talk about it and grateful uh, for the other events that are planned to commemorate uh, the riot in Memphis this spring. It's not just the riot that really needs to be better appreciated. It's this whole era of reconstruction, the 12 year period following the end of the Civil War. Last year marked the sesquicentennial of the end of the Civil War and now the sesquicentennial of reconstruction is on us. I hope that this will inspire more Americans uh, to learn uh, more about that crucial era of Reconstruction, which in the popular mind is usually overshadowed by the Civil War. Maybe I'm biased, but I, I really believe that Reconstruction is just as interesting a historical topic as the Civil War. And while a lot of my fellow historians agree with me, uh, it's, hard to it's hard to convince people outside the historical profession of this. For those of you who may be reluctant to pick up a book on Reconstruction for fear it's going to be that stereotypical dry as dust history like the high school text some of us uh, had to endure back in the old days, uh, let me say that Reconstruction was not all about politics any more than the Civil War was all about battlefield maneuvers. Uh, and the best Reconstruction histories uh, being written today are, in my opinion, uh, just as captivating as the best Civil War histories. So. There's my plug for Reconstruction. Thank you. How do you want to handle the Q&A? We have the two mics. So as I said in my introductory uh, comments, we have uh, two mics. Uh, uh, Sue and Bonnie will go around. If you'll just raise your hand, uh, we'll recognize you. If you'll just speak into the mic, uh, uh, we'll do that. Professor Ash. Yes. Yes, ma'am. You spoke about uh, the population. I'm here. Over this other way. <laughs> Here. Okay, okay, okay. Uh -huh. You spoke about the increase in the African-American population in Memphis between 1865 and 1870. What about, okay, in 1865. What about the increase in the white population of poor whites who also came into the city? And what was the size of Memphis at that time? Memphis's population when the Civil War began was about 16,000. It was not a large city, except by Southern standards that was pretty large, but by, by national standards it was not large. But about uh, 16,000 uh, Memphians in, when the Civil War began, of, of whom about a fourth, a quarter, were, were black. Now, by the time of the, the riot in the spring of 1866, no census was taken about that time, and we had to wait another four years for the federal census. But my best guess is that the population of the city may have been 40,000 by then. So the population of the city went from 16,000 to probably 40,000 in the space of uh, four, uh, uh, four years, of whom, and of those 40,000, which is, as I say, my best guess, of those, about half were black. So the black black numbers not only increased, but the black proportion of the city increased. But yes, there were a lot more poor whites in the city than there had been to. All, all parts of the population uh, increased, but uh, there were a large number of, of, uh, of, of 
it, it, black, especially Irish immigrants coming into the city too, Return, and returning Confederate soldiers, that kind of thing. But the cities, that's why the city was so, had become such a difficult place to live in. Not that it was, not that it was a particularly uh, ideal place to live before the war, but with 40,000 people you know, crammed into that city in 1866, uh, and, and uh, it, it was a very unhealthy place to be. Who's got the, yeah. Oh, um, I, I have to go with whoever has the microphone, yeah. I got the mic. Um, is it on? Okay. Uh, speaking of correlations, um, I got here late. I don't know if you made this uh, known or not. Uh, you were saying, um, what, what was the motives for such a brutal uh, uh, massacre? Two years before, up the river, there was a massacre, Fort Pillow. A massacre by a fellow we know, Nathan Bedford Farrer. I think that might have been the motives, because um, they they tried. I, I would imagine that that might have been the motives to uh, the reason to try to to end this that time. Well, they, yes, there was a there was the infamous Fort Pillow massacre. The, of course, the circumstances of that were quite different from the. Uh, the okay, we can say it was a war. Yeah, yeah, the war was on. It was carried out by Confederate soldiers mm -hmm. against Union soldiers who had surrendered uh, in Fort Pillow when it was captured by Forrest's troops. So I don't know that there's a direct connection there, but the, the events of, uh, of, uh, of that Fort Pillow massacre, they were known, in, uh, they were known to black Memphians uh, in 1866, believe me, I know, because and I mentioned this in the book too. At one point, some detachments of the third colored heavy artillery were sent up to Fort Pillow, this is after the war was over, to reinter the bodies of those massacre victims at mm -hmm. Fort Pillow, uh, which had just been haphazardly buried where they fell. Uh, so the, it was well known among the black population of Memphis in 1866 about what had occurred uh, at Fort Pillow two, two years before. Uh, but, but whether the connection uh, uh, goes any farther than that between the events in Memphis and the events at Fort Pillow, uh, I can't say. We can't say. Yeah, can't say. To be seen. <laughs> to be continued. Um, yes, uh, I'm over here. Left. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> For uh, some reason, the, the voices seem to come over. From yeah, I'm doing now. a trick. Um, <laughs> So uh, one of the large things that, that struck me about this was that it's a, it's a largely by percentage Irish riot. And I was just curious as if uh, in your studies you found similar causes or, um, well, I guess just causes um, of this kind of riot or of large scale riots, say as in uh, some of the New York riots, which also was largely Irish, as I recall. Yeah, uh, one of the things I mentioned in the, my final chapter, which is a kind of a uh, a review of how the massacre has been remembered and, and how we should understand it uh, uh, in its broader context. Uh, one of the things I pointed out was this, this riot uh, can be seen as a, a, an example of, uh, of the kind of rioting we had seen in American cities uh, in the North. And you mentioned especially the, uh, uh, the New York City draft riots of 1863, in which working class white men, in fact many of them Irish Americans, had unleashed their fury on the black population. Uh, so yes, that's one way to look at the, the massacre, that it, that it is you know, a, 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 another instance of this urban kind of violence that has nothing to do with the, the, the circumstances of Reconstruction. However, I prefer to think of this this uh, Memphis massacre of 1866 as very much predominantly related to the events of Reconstruction. That is, this was a reaction to black freedom in the South. It was a reaction by white people uh, to black freedom. But the, 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 the hostility between the Irish and the black people in Memphis predated the Civil War. It went back 
quite a ways. The Irish had always been, and the blacks had always been hostile to one another. Uh, because even in the days of slavery, uh, the slaves were compete, you know, taking jobs that a lot of the Irishmen thought should be theirs. So, but there are a number of ways to be looking, to, to look at it. Another way to look at, the, at, the, at this riot is as another uh, example in a long line of slave uprising scares. The South had, had periodically experienced these slave uprising scares or panics. They almost never had any basis in, in fact. I mean, there, were, there was almost never, there were very few actual slave rebellions, but there was fear of them among the whites, and the whites reacted fiercely to them. And you see these repeatedly throughout Southern history. Uh, and, in, in, and in some ways, this, this Memphis uh, episode can be seen like that, too. The white people, you know, I told you the word got out on the street that this was a black uprising, and that's why it had to be put down so savagely, because otherwise the whites are thinking, we're, we're, we're going to get killed. I have a question right here. OK. Right here. Oh, yeah. uh, Sorry. Professor Ash, I noticed that on the front cover of your book, as well as uh, during your lecture, you used interchangeably riot and massacre together. And I'm not sure if you're aware of the debate that's going on with the Tennessee Historical Commission and uh, that whole issue involving whether it should be called the massacre and, and uh, in terms of describing the history and so forth. If you could speak to that, please. I, I am aware uh, to, a, to a degree about the, the, uh, the issue with the Tennessee Historical Commission and the wording of the uh, the historical marker that has been requested. And uh, all I can say about it is you have, to, you have to only look at the cover of my book to find out which side of that debate I'm on. <laughs> I, call, I call it a massacre in Memphis. And to me, it fits the, you know, the dictionary definition of a massacre. And if somebody, for their own reasons, refuses to call it a massacre and doesn't want to call it a massacre, well, that's fine. But, it was, to me, it was both a riot and a massacre. Uh, and that's, that's all I have to say on that. Thank you, Professor Ash. Uh, I have a two for you. Uh, for one, do you, th do you think that the rioters knew that that regiment was being disarmed and that kind of could have pre precipitated it? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. It was known through the newspapers that the regiment was mustering out. Uh, but if anything, no, I think if anything, that should have kind of dampened the racial hostility because what they were, you know, what so many whites were afraid of was that regiment, you know, in active service and under arms. Uh, when, it, when it was known that, uh, and, and announced in the newspapers that the regiment was mustering out and had been disarmed, you would think that that would, uh, you know, that would uh, uh, hinder, you know, or, or suppress any kind of reaction by the white population. So I don't know that uh, that, that there's a connection there. The uh, because it wasn't just the men of the black regiment that 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 whites were afraid of. It was the whole black population of the city. So. Uh, I don't think that, 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 that there's a connection there. And the other I had, since you brought it up about Reconstruction, do you ever think the term radical in front of that will be taken off of it? Because that was an opinion of. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I, I, I confess guilty, guilty of, uh, of using the terminology that they themselves uh, uh, used for their own purposes back in those days. I think, however, we're, we're just kind of stuck with that terminology uh, because uh, historians, by referring to radical reconstruction, historians refer to a particular part of reconstruction, uh, the, the, the part that, that happened after Congress took control of, uh, of, uh, of reconstruction from President Johnson. And I guess, I guess you could, some people have called it congressional reconstruction as opposed to presidential reconstruction, but that doesn't really, to call it congressional reconstruction doesn't really uh, 
tell us much about what was going on in the South in those days. It tells us what, tells us what Congress did. But once the black people got their, their rights with the, the 14th and the 15th Amendments uh, and the Reconstruction Acts that Congress passed in 1867-68, uh, then what you see in the, in the South has to have its own name somehow. And uh, because black people are, are voting and they're mobilizing and winning elections and taking control of state legislatures and and uh, that has to have some kind of a name. And uh, to call it radical reconstruction, I think it's not completely unfair because it was radical. It was revolutionary, considering that only a few years before black people had been slaves and now they're voting in elections. Some of them are going to, 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 to the state legislature, serving in you know, political office. So it was maybe revolutionary reconstruction is a better, better term, but you're right to catch me on that one. Uh, Professor Ash, uh, yes. where, um, first off, I uh, thank you for your lecture, it was very insightful. Uh, my question is, were there any uh, first-hand accounts from the blacks that, uh, that was able to flee or get away from the, uh, from the riots, or yes. like from in newspapers or something like that? Yeah, there were quite a few. Uh, there were quite a few accounts among the witness testimonies uh, from blacks who had escaped uh, with their lives. Uh, a lot of black people fled the city. It will not surprise you to learn that a lot of black people fled the city, as did almost all the northern missionaries, too. I didn't, I didn't mention what happened, but the northern missionaries okay. and the Freedmen's Bureau agents were also threatened during the riot, although none was actually attacked. But, the, but a lot of the witnesses heard the, the, the rioters saying, you know, once we've gotten rid of these black people, we're going after the Yankees next. So in, as the riot was going on, a lot of black people fled the city. A lot of the Yankee missionaries fled the city too. Uh, but yes, those those the congressional uh, or the, the testimonies of those three investigating uh, commissions uh, are are full of, of accounts by black people who had managed to escape with their their lives. Dr. Ash, thank you for your book. I find it interesting that it took a non-Memphian to write it. And happy St. Patty's Day, 2016. I, I was afraid somebody would mention that iron. <laughs> was it planned or is it an, an ironic coincidence that your lecture uh, is on March 17th? Pure coincidence that it occurred on St. Patrick's Day. And I, I, I hope that uh, nobody will, uh, will think that I am defaming their Irish uh, forebears. I am not. <laughs> oh, so I have a question here over on your left. Yes. So how united was the white population in their view that this riot was justified? Were there any white leaders, community leaders, who uh, did not condone the riots or spoke out against it? Some, some among the, uh, for, if you're talking about the city of Memphis, the, the, native, the native white population, the southern, southern whites in the city, not, not counting the Yankees. Uh, some of them were less adamant than others that that you know it was all the blacks' fault and it was and that it was a good lesson to them. Uh, but I think I think on the whole, the great majority of the southern whites in the city uh, did have this feeling that while while the rioters may have gone to you know unnecessary extremes. Uh, and that they're, they're, you know, and that murdering all these people on the streets and torching uh, schools and churches, that was going too far. But a lot, of, but, but, but most white people said, still, the blacks brought this on themselves. That was, that was the sense among most white people, as far as I can tell. Um, I have a question over here, other side. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, you, said, you said that it was really well documented. Why was nothing particularly written about it until your book? And was there any particular reason, or did everyone just choose to ignore that part of history? I, I don't know. It has not been ignored by historians. As I said, there, have been, there were several articles published about it uh, before, uh, before my book, uh, taking, you know, looking at different aspects of the riot. Uh, but why no, no historian had taken a, t 
taken a, a, as a full-length book project? I don't know. I, I simply can't answer that. It seems ready-made for you know, a historical project, and it just happened to be there when I was looking for a, a new topic. And I, I did not realize when I first got into it just how extraordinary the sources were. But I, I can't answer that question. I don't know if there's a reason. Just, just happenstance, I suppose. I have a question over here. Mm -hmm. um, professor, at the beginning, you discussed how important this massacre is in our US history. But what is its significance in our contemporary world today? Well, I think <laughs> that's a very good question. I think it, for one thing, I think it needs to be remembered because it shows, as I said before, it shows us, it reminds us of something that we often forget about, which is, or some of us often forget about, in the, or people in the general public often forget about, which is, is the central role of, of racism and racial violence in shaping our nation's history. Uh, uh, it has been an important factor uh, throughout our nation's history, and it needs to be remembered. Um, another, another thing I, I think is important, another reason it's important to, to, uh, to remember the riot is that it, uh, it, it brings to light the experience of common people uh, in, in, in history. They have shaped history too, you know, just as much as the great the great men and the presidents and all of that have shaped our history. And it's important, this is a, an extraordinary uh, episode for, for learning about the common people as I, as I explain. And so I think it's, it's, it's worthwhile to see how the common people helped, you know, their experience also helped shape our nation's, you know, our nation's future. And, and of course, it was very important, as I said, uh, you know, in bringing us some, uh, some legislation that continues to impact our lives today. The 14th Amendment, for one thing, which continues to play a vital role uh, in our nation's uh, laws. I have a question. Um, other than the newspapers, what or who else connected the riot to the rest of the union? And did the union react to the riot? Like, what did they do because of the riot? Did they, like, protest? Are you talking about the people outside the South? Yes. Uh, yeah, the people outside the South, there was a strong public reaction uh, it, uh, among the people. Uh, and, and that is one of the things that is in the, in the North. There were, there were editorials in a lot of the Northern newspapers in the wake of this. And the Northern newspapers, a lot of Northern newspapers and Western newspapers covered the, the riot extensively. Uh, and there was a, there was a, an outcry among many Northerners uh, about you know what is going on in the South, you know, and it it and it came down to uh, uh, President John. It made President Johnson look very bad because his policy was to go easy on the you know the white South, let him back in the Union, uh, trust the white South to deal fairly with the freed people, and this made Johnson uh, policy you know look very wrong-headed to a lot of. Of, uh, of, of Northerners. So it was very much on the minds of Northern people, especially when they went to the polls that fall for the off-year elections of, a, of the fall of 1866 when they returned an even bigger uh, majority of Republicans to Congress. So that, and that's what gave Congress then the power to overturn Johnson's Reconstruction Plan completely. So it was very much on the minds of the voters in the North in the fall of 1866. Dr. Ash, on your right. No. No. Yes, yes, sir. Um, quick question. In the aftermath of this police-led massacre, are you aware of um, the Memphis Police Department being disbanded or remade, or is it potentially possible that to this day we have a police department that can trace its lineage back to this exact no, you same can't. organization? <laughs> no. <laughs> Now I have to say there is there is no continuity between the police, the police force in Memphis in the spring of 1866 and that uh, which uh, Memphis has now. No, in fact, uh, within a couple of months after the riot, the 
the state legislature abolished, the state legislature, which was under control of Republicans uh, for complicated reasons, uh, but uh, the state legislature abolished the Memphis Police Department, replaced it with another one whose, whose commissioners were appointed by the governor. Uh, and uh, so the, the police department was completely changed within a, a few months after the riot. Um, over here on the your left side. Um, so you said that a large amount of blacks fled Memphis shortly after this riot. Was there a significant um, dynamic shift in the ratio between uh, whites and blacks shortly after the riot? Oh, no, a good question. No, uh, it, it was, it was uh, temporary, I think. Uh, th I think it was a temporary uh, flight of black people and, and Yankee, you know, and some Yankees uh, from the city. And as, as soon as the riot was over, I think most of them returned. So there was no, there was no uh, fundamental change in the, in the racial or demographics of the city as a result of the, the riot. As soon as things calmed down, uh, most of those people came back. Hi there, uh, I'm over on your right. Probably not politically, but uh, anyway. Uh, my question is, uh, regard I'm about six weeks out from finishing a dissertation about reconstruction, so I uh, thank you for all the work you've done on that. Um, and I wanted to ask about uh, if you found in the course of your research any uh, instances of people's interpretations from the ground of the burning of schoolhouses particularly. I'm really interested in uh, the role of public education that in all of this and how inspiring and important that was to African-American communities at the time. Um, did you find in any of these testimonies people talking about the sort of symbolic or interpretive uh, nature of schools and the, like, the sort of specific targeting of schools that happened during this time? Yeah. Ooh. Uh, Yes, uh, uh, another good question. Uh, the, it was clear to everybody that the, t the schools were targeted in particular, and the black churches too, because they had, like black churches even today, they were you know, focuses of the, of the black community, and the schools especially, uh, because most, most white people at the time in the South uh, saw no reason that black people should be educated. Uh, the, the saying among white people in those years after the Civil War was, you know, educate a Negro and you spoil a good field hand. Uh, they just, you know, the idea that these, it, the, the white people saw these schools as just something that's gonna give the black people ideas above their station. You know, that's they're gonna make them discontented with being uh, uh, hewers of wood and drawers of water for the white race. So, so, and by the same token, the schools were just that important for the, for the black population too. Those were real symbols of hope. Uh, the, the, the churches were symbols of the new community, which they could now have because they're free. Uh, the schools uh, were symbols of what they, they might achieve as a race in the future. So yes, there's a lot of, and, and, uh, and another thing that comes through is in, in even the, some of the white uh, newspaper editorials is that um, burning down churches and schools was probably going a little too far, you know. Even if, the, even if they think that overall the riot taught a salutary lesson, you know, they, they kind of regretted that. But they always added in the same breath. But of course the blacks brought it on themselves. Yes. Um, I'd like to ask about what's called the Dunning School of American History where it's been repudiated now, but around 1900, it was the, what's viewed now as a very racist view of history had a predominant role, even including Woodrow Wilson. Uh, how in the world can American views shift back and forth so extremely? And if so, how can we have any faith in discourse today? Well, uh, the, the Dunning School, the so-called Dunning School of Reconstruction Historiography is actually still alive and well today among the many people in the general population. Historians, professional historians have rejected it. This is the view of Reconstruction, for those of you who don't know, the view of Reconstruction, uh, Dunning was a historian, uh, writing around the turn of the century and he had a lot of students who also wrote uh, but this is the interpretation of Reconstruction that sees it just as you see it portrayed in Gone with the Wind. That is, it was a terrible time. 
when these awful carpetbaggers and scalawags and, and uneducated black people rode roughshod over the, the noble former Confederates, you know, and the, the former Confederates had to bring this to an end, and the South was better off with Reconstruction, you know, destroyed, uh, and the black people brought back to their proper place. Uh, that's the Dunning School. And to this day, you meet a lot, you'll meet people who, who still, you know, believe that that's what Reconstruction was all about. That all they know about it is from what they saw in Gone with the Wind. So the Dunning School has, you know, been dismissed by professional historians. Uh, uh, historians see it as a Reconstruction as a, from a very different uh, light. But I'd, I would not say the Dunning School is dead and gone in the popular mind anyway. Yes. Um, Dr. Ash, uh, I did find it ironic, like my man said on uh, St. Patrick's Day, that in 1866, also the church St. Patrick's was actually built at New Annex in 1866. It has a mark on the, on the, uh, the side of the church. Um, but I wanted to find out in your research, did you find any accounts where you said the, the initial contact or the initial skirmish were with the soldiers and the Irish police officers you said they were out hanging out in the streets, but I, I want to know if you find anything that said that they may have been inside a Mr. Church's, Robert Church's saloon, and said the, 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 the policemen were responding to a call in a, to a saloon, or something to that effect. No, I, no I've, never, I've never seen anything that associated the, that, initial, uh, uh, that initial shootout with, with Church's Saloon. Now, I talk about Church's Saloon. This is Robert Church Sr., by the way, the father of the Robert Church who became politically powerful in Memphis uh, in the early 20th century. That was Robert Church Jr. Uh, his father, Robert Church Jr.'s father, uh, was a, a freed slave who had, had built up a business, a, a, very, a very lucrative business with a, a kind of an upscale billiard saloon in Memphis. And I mentioned that in the riot. It, it was attacked by rioters uh, but but there was no no connection that I've ever found between that initial shootout uh, uh, and uh, the, the the policeman involved in that and and uh, uh, church's saloon. No. And, and one more, the, the uh, your constant reference to the Irish and black conflict. What did you find most of the research from newspapers or from personal accounts? Personal accounts. The, con the conflict between uh, the long-standing hostility between the Irish and the black people of Memphis, as I said, going back before the Civil War, was well documented in newspapers especially. Uh, that, uh, but it also came out in the testimony of these various witnesses, because some of the witnesses were asked to talk about relations between the city's Irish and the city's black, and they talked about how well I, you know, they would say, well, I've been in Memphis for you know 40 years, and it's you know, the, the Irish have always hated the blacks, and the blacks have always hated the Irish. So uh, there, there are various sources on that, but especially newspapers and some of the congressional. Just on that question, obviously Professor Ash goes into more detail in the book, and I know that there are a lot of other questions that are out there, um, and for me, that's a real marker that that something important has happened. We should leave an event uh, that we perhaps didn't know as much about as we should, as we should know about and that we know about uh, now with lots of questions. And, and I think the Memphis Massacre of 1866 makes us ask a lot of those questions about the past that have not been asked often enough and the questions that we've had tonight about the relationship to the present as well make evident that this past is something that we have to think through if we're going to deal with the issues of the present. But there is going to be an opportunity for you to ask those questions to another fabulous historian. Professor Tim Hubner will be at the public library uh, in the Memphis room, which is the archive where a lot of these documents um, dealing with Memphis history are housed uh, on Tuesday night, the 22nd, from 5.30 to 7.30. It's only one of many other opportunities that are gonna be happening between now and May 21st uh, first for folks to get a deeper sense of what went on with the Memphis Massacre and what its significance is. So don't leave tonight without one of these um, postcards. There are lots more of them that are here. They'll give you uh, the web 
site as well as some other events. We're going to be doing another very different uh, conversation a month from now about uh, the significance of the year 1616. So for those of you who haven't been to a Communities in Conversation event before, we're doing this on a regular basis. Please come and join us. All of these are free and open to the public. I think they're fascinating. But before we leave tonight and y'all head over to the line to go and purchase a Professor Ash's book because you want to know more and get him to sign your book and ask questions to him individually, let's give him a round of applause for a wonderful talk. <laughs>